Good morning and welcome to To The Point. This week we are going to take a break from some of those important races that we've been talking about in terms of the head to head matchup. We've been doing those over the past several weeks, but not getting away from the important races at all because we're going to be talking about races in the state house. Representative Brandon Dillon is a Democrat from Grand Rapids and is our guest again. Thank you very much for Thanks being here. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. I have you here this morning for a couple of reasons. One is because we've been doing these races. We've been trying to introduce folks to these candidates. And the reason it is so vitally important, as you and I have talked in the past, there are some districts within this state that are pretty much decided when the primary is over. It's just the nature of the way they are. Here in West Michigan, uh, there are some districts you can look at and say those are gonna be Republican districts, right. almost certainly, Absolutely. in the fall, unless something unusual happens. There are others that you can say are almost certainly gonna be Democratic. Same on the east side of the state, where you have perhaps some more democratically drawn districts over there, nature of the way districts get drawn. However, those aren't the ones we're watching so closely now. These are the ones that we're looking at now that are competitive. Mm -hmm. Before we get to those specifics and some of the ones that we've been featuring, I want to talk to you about your role in this because uh, as one of the leaders of the Democrats, one of your jobs is to make sure you get more Democrats elected. Well, that is one of the um, tasks I've been um, asked to try to accomplish, and I'm happy to do it because I do think um, you know, we need some serious changes in the House. But you're absolutely right about the gerrymandering that's gone on in the state. There are very few districts, unfortunately, that have that kind of competitive balance where you can have a real robust exchange of ideas in the general election. But we're certainly looking at about 12 to 15 of those on the Republican side and also about uh, five to seven Democratic seats that we have to protect. So out of the 110, there's about 20 seats that will probably determine who controls the House after the November election, and we're out there actively engaging all the way from northern Michigan. There's plenty of seats right here in this media market in West Michigan, but also seats uh, southeast Michigan and all points in between. We're, we've got camp campaigns and candidates out there working very hard and have been doing so for a long time. Republicans have their candidates who are out there hopefully not working as hard, but um, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be fighting it out uh, until November, and I think we're gonna have a very close election um, for control of the House. Your counterpart uh, over on the Republican side of the aisle, Eric Nesbitt, will be here uh, in the second half of the show to give us his take on this, but let's talk numbers for a minute. Where are we right now? Republicans, where Democrats, we have at least one Independent. Right. We currently have the, the split is 59-50 with one independent who represented, um, he won't be coming back, represented a district with a 98% Democratic base. So um, that will be represented by a Democrat. So, so essentially it, it's 59-51. Democrats picked up seven seats um, in the last election to get us where we are uh, now. Uh, we need to pick up five for an outright majority and four. Uh, for a shared power situation. We have candidates, uh, we believe, um, in 10 to 12 Republican districts that have a real shot of winning and knocking off either an incumbent or filling an open seat that's currently held by a Republican. Um, and we're, we're eager to get out and talk about our message. We know for a fact that even though these districts have been gerrymandered and s some may tilt slightly Republican, that the message that we're carrying in all of these districts resonates much more with the voters. We see at the top of the ticket that Mark Schauer has the momentum right now, and we think that's going to continue to election day. When you talk about these districts and when we talk about competitive districts, we should put a, a little finer point on that. There are a handful of districts out there that might have changed the control of the State House of Representatives in the last cycle that's that right. collectively were won or lost by like 3,000 votes. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, and that, that's not in one district. That's that's over about five or six districts. That's how close they get. Absolutely. A lot of these districts are um, decided by a couple hundred votes, up to a thousand votes. Very small um, amount of voters in the overall scheme of how many voters are in the state. And in fact, if you go back to the last election cycle, Democrats actually carried 52% of the votes statewide in state house elections. But because of the way the districts are drawn, um, we were unable to get to the majority. But you know, we're gonna be fighting hard. There's a few of those seats where we lost by just a couple hundred votes. We've got great candidates running there. We've got great candidates in running in other seats that we haven't historically challenged, but we know that the incumbent has either made some really bad votes or we have a great challenger or both. When you get to one of those districts where it's been close historically over the, the past couple of cycles, are you more interested in pursuing those where it's an open seat or are you giving the same uh, amount of pressure on those where there's an incumbent? Because the incumbency, no matter what, does have a certain advantage that goes along with it. Yeah, historically incumbency is, is, is an advantage that makes it much tougher for a challenger to win. But I would say this, I think in general, open seats provide 
usually a better opportunity, but with the record that some of these incumbents have compiled over the last two and three years with raising taxes on seniors in the middle class, the devastating uh, effects of their education policy, we think that it's actually better to be matching up our candidates' priorities with an actual record that they have that we know that voters don't agree with. I want to talk a little bit more about the specifics, and you certainly have touched on some of those, and we will here in just a minute, but I, I want to get just a couple more of the inside politic things, because I'm not sure people understand how organized or how complex it is when you go into a, an election cycle like this one. Everything is up for grabs, from uh, those seats that are available on the Supreme Court, every member of the U.S. House of Representatives that represents Michigan, in fact, in the entire nation. Uh, this year we have an open U.S. Senate seat, which is the first time in a couple of decades that we've had that. The governor's race, the constitutional right. office is 110 seats in the House and 38 over in the Senate. I mean, everything is on the table. So that means that there's somebody over in the Senate in your position that's trying to find candidates, recruit candidates, that part's mm -hmm. over now. They're raising money trying to get people to vote. It means that the U.S. Senate candidate is out there trying to raise money and get people to vote. Mm -hmm. It means that those candidates for constitutional offices in the U.S. House are trying to raise money and get people to vote. Do you at some point find that you get in competition with yourself? Because, I mean, that's a lot of fundraising and a lot of electioneering going on. Well, there certainly is always a, it's always a challenge to find the amount of resources that you need to run a House race, a Senate race, a U.S. Senate race, whatever the race it is. And we, you know, we inevitably end up talking to a lot of the same people who like to contribute to candidates that they agree with their stance on issues and share their values. But I think more and more there's a real synergy when you have good campaigns up and down the ticket. So it's not a zero-sum game. When, when Mark Schauer is out raising money and doing well, it helps Democrats who are running for House, and the same with Gary Peters and all the other candidates statewide on the ticket. We certainly need to have a certain amount of resources to be able to communicate our message, but there is kind of a layering effect when you have good candidates that are running above you, and really everybody's talking about the same things. The values that all these candidates share are very similar, talking about tax fairness, uh, investing in education, making sure that we're protecting women's health care. Those are things that we're all talking about. So whether it's communicated at the gubernatorial level or at the state house level, as long as the messages are consistent, it usually helps all candidates who are running in that area. In 1986, the Republicans had a pretty bad year. It was the sixth year of the Reagan administration. The president uh, had numbers that were relatively low, although higher mm -hmm. than many at the six year mark. Um, I use that as an example because every six years into a two term president, the party in power has some difficulty. This president is no different in that his numbers are lower now certainly than they were two years ago or six years ago. Uh, how does that impact on this race or does it? Well, it certainly has an impact. The, the, the general environment out there with voters is, is often a very strong determinant of how people will uh, pull the, the uh, lever on election day. But it's not conclusive. And I think the idea that this is gonna, somehow going to be a year uh, similar to 2010 is just not borne out by the evidence. The one uh, advantage that Democrats have this year, even with the president not as popular as he has been in the past, is we have one thing going for us, and that people have seen what happens when Republicans take full control in 2010, whether it was in Michigan or the way the Congress has behaved. So the fact that the president's numbers aren't high is really counterbalanced by the fact that the Republican brand is not thought of very well, and Governor Snyder's numbers are certainly not uh, lighting up anybody's scoreboard. I mean, we've, we've got a real chance. At this point, uh, four years ago, the numbers for Democrats were extremely bad. Uh, what we're seeing in Michigan and what you're seeing nationwide is that these districts are going to be fought out district by district on issues that are important to the people in the state of Michigan. The president certainly has some um, effect on people's overall general attitudes, but so does the governor and so does the record that Republicans have compiled in the state over the last three years, and we think that gives us a great opportunity to really match up our agenda with theirs here locally, here in the state, and win. The other side of that coin may be this, and that is that the new party chairman for the Michigan Democrats has close ties with the Obama campaign, and they have a very sophisticated turnout the vote mechanism that the Obama folks used in two different cycles, and it, and of course you've got deep list and all of sure. those things that go along with it, so that could be a plus. It's, it's a Democrats. huge, it, it, you know, we, we as, as a party, I believe, uh, Democrats have really really 
decided to focus more of our efforts at this point on making sure that we get Democrats who may not have that history of voting off your elections to the polls. And Lon Johnson has been single-minded in his focus on making sure that we are concentrating and directing the resources there. Um, we know that if we just get about 5 to 10 percent of those people who didn't vote in 2010 that we know are Democrats, that we win statewide. It doesn't matter what happens anywhere else. If those people come up to vote, we win. And it helps us in our targeted House districts and Senate districts. Some of these districts are going to be decided by three four, five hundred votes. If we get a few percentage points of Democrats who didn't turn out in 2010 to come out, we're going to win. And we're confident that that's going to happen. If, if that happens, and let's just take a couple of scenarios, it seems to me as an observer, the most likely place for you to make a legislative pickup is in the House. Sure. The Senate is a much, much, much higher bar, given not only the numbers, but <laughs> given the fact uh, that those districts are also drawn to be sure. in, in favor one way or the other. Um, is the best that you could hope for coming out of this a Democrat big win, but you still have divided government? It's quite possible. I mean, I don't think anybody um, is planning on the Senate flipping this cycle, but I certainly think they're going to pick up seats and make some significant gains. In the House, we have a very good shot at taking the majority, but I think at the very least, we're going to pick up seats and we're going to make it um, a more... Uh, balanced House of Representatives, and I think we really have a shot at taking control and having a new speaker next session. Um, and I think Mark Schauer has a great shot of winning. The, the trend lines in this polling has been good. What, the better he does, the better we do. Um, I frankly don't have a problem with divided government. I think we would have had more divided government over the last four years. Um, we would have had better policy that's more sustainable, and you wouldn't see all the acrimonious division in this state that you're seeing now. We are 60 some odd days out from uh, Election Day as this will air. And as you and I both know, that can be a lifetime mm -hmm. in politics. But as you look at this today, you seem pretty optimistic about your chances, not your chances sure. individually, but your party's chances uh, moving forward. Uh, very short period of time. If you get some of the wins you talk about, if you get a governor, if you get a, a democratically controlled uh, house, what are the first things that, that you would want to do? I think two things right out of the gate. Um, uh, first and foremost is reduce um, the tax burden on the middle class and senior citizens. People have had their taxes raised over the last three years to pay for a $2 billion corporate tax cut. Second, and I think equally important, um, reversing the trend in education funding and actually uh, reinvesting in K-12 education, particularly in some of these areas that have significant challenges with poverty and other sorts of social issues. We think investing in education, re, uh, re um, energizing the tax code to favor the middle class is the best way to get the economy back on track. And I think every Democrat running in the state this year shares those two priorities. Brandon Dillon, as always, thank you for being with us. We'll talk to you again between now and the election and certainly after, and we're back with more To The Point in just a moment. Welcome back to To The Point. Representative Eric Nesbitt is a Republican from Lawton. He joins us now, not so much as that representative from Lawton, but as one of the guys who has been tagged with working with your uh, colleagues and working with others and trying to, in your case, uh, continue a majority over in the House of Representatives. And, and want to reset this for a minute. We talked just a moment ago uh, with Representative Brandon Dillon about his role as the, the Democrat who is trying uh, to increase the Democratic numbers and they hope take a uh, majority over in the House. How difficult is it when you get in an election cycle like this because you have all of these individual races, and we'll talk about some of the broader races in a moment, but you also have to keep an eye on that 110, and in your case, anything over 56, I assume. Yeah, going into the 2014 election, uh, House Republicans have a very strong record to run, run on. And we saw that in 2012, even when uh, President Obama carried the state by 10 points, that we still kept 59 to a 51 seat majority in the, in the state house. And a lot is, of that has to do with the fact that we've been de delivering real results for Michigan taxpayers. We've been delivering those real results as they see things are finally starting to come back. You see the record of the Grand Home shower era uh, over the last, uh, the previous decade before and, and where you saw unemployment rates going up, where you saw, uh, you know, higher taxes, higher budget deficits, not being able to tackle the real issues that are needed. And over the last three and a half years, we've been laser focused on job creation, 286,000 new private sector jobs created in Michigan, all from working on that tax reform package, empowering uh, small businesses to be able to invest and grow more, uh, attracting more workers, 
passing uh, over uh, laws that would eliminate about 2,000 rules and regulations here in the state uh, and really uh, empowering uh, uh, teachers and, and educators and parents to make those uh, you know real decisions by enhancing career and technical education and investing more in schools. So we have a strong record to run on. We have a lot of candidates running as, as incumbents with that record while being accessible and accountable and available to their constituents and, and their districts. You lay out your case. Let's talk a little bit more about the technical part of it. We'll come back to what the issues are here, but Realistically, how many races do you have out there that you focus on? Because as we talked to a, a earlier in this show, a lot of these districts are pretty much done after the primary. It doesn't mean they can't change. doesn't mm -hmm. mean that there isn't always that possibility. But there are some of these districts that are drawn either to be so Republican or so Democratic that it's very difficult to get a substantial challenge into them. So as, as the guy who is kind of the point person for Republicans, when you look at these House seats, how many do you really focus on? Well, we filed, you know, there was 110 Republicans that filed in all 110 se seats across the state. However, you look at areas such as here in, in West Michigan that we have real opportunities to win a, a pick up some Republican seats with Holly Hughes up in Muskegon, uh, Donnie Joe DeYoung uh, here in Grand Rapids, and Dr. John Bison down in, in Battle Creek. Both bring unique uh, tools to the, uh, you know, as they run. Dr. Bison served thousands of, uh, of patients down in uh, Calhoun County, very well, uh, well known down there, and is an effective solution oriented leader. Donnie Joe DeYoung is a very strong uh, fiscal accountability uh, individual who doesn't just uh, preach about it, but actually has practiced it in the past when she was comptroller here in the city of Grand Rapids. She said that there was uh, taxpayer money being you know, wasted and spent in a position that should be part-time instead of full-time. And she stood up for those beliefs, and we need that kind of leaders in, in Lansing. Somebody like Holly Hughes is a proven job creator who's run a manufacturing firm. And so you see here in West Michigan, those are really three of the key uh, races that uh, we'll be uh, looking at in terms of uh, potential pickups. And there's another half dozen or so across the state where we have some really solid candidates from the first uh, female general uh, to come from Michigan, running in western Wayne County, uh, to uh, another doctor up in uh, the th a district in the Thumb area, uh, all, all good uh, pickup seats. When you look at the three races you just outlined here in western Michigan, two of those are where incumbent Democrats are running uh, in the 76th district with Winnie Brinks and up in the 91st district with Colleen Lamonti. In fact, up in the 91st with Holly Hughes and Colleen Lamonti. That's just a rematch of what we saw two years ago, except the situation was swapped then when Representative Hughes was the incumbent. Uh, the third you mentioned is an open seat. But when you look at that, I mean, that obviously raises the difficulty level a little bit because incumbents do have a certain advantage well in terms of and they also have a record and so as you look at it what have the results that have been and we've been seen from the house democrats uh, i work well with a lot of them but we see overall from the leadership from the house house democrats instead of providing solutions instead of trying to work on on the issues and providing their own point of view that they vote no and that's not a solution for michigan we've been offering those real solutions over the last three and a half years. House Republicans along with uh, with Governor Snyder. Solutions on jobs, solutions on tax reforms. Uh, and we're still working on, you know, we've already put in over $900 million into roads in terms of one-time funding and, and the House Republicans have offered a plan that permanently get us up another half billion dollars. We hear from Democrats it's not enough, but they don't offer an alternative solution. We offered a balanced budget in 2011 after the a lost decade of Grand Home and, and Shower. We actually uh, offered a, our first balanced budget that into that structural deficit and instead of you know they voted no and they didn't bring up an alternative budget and I haven't seen an alternative budget from them in the last three years that they offered a billion dollars of more spending that would blow the cap off from the budget without alternatives and how do we achieve uh, those goals and so I look for solutions and I know the individuals running in these districts such as Holly Hughes or Donnie Joe DeYoung and Dr. Bison are looking for for real solutions. When you take a look at the election in total, how much of this is individual effort? Because we know, particularly running for the state house, that is a physical race. You go out and you knock on doors, and in a lot of cases you do it in the primary, and then you have to come back and do it in the general. There's a lot of work that is involved. There is also money that has to be raised and all of that. 
But how much of this will hinge on individual participation by candidates, which we know is very important, and how much of it will be overshadowed by what happens at the top of the ticket, uh, a race for governor, for example, where we have seen polls within the margin of error for the past 90 days or so? Yeah. <clears throat> You look at the state house races, uh, and, and I can name any number of districts where we had uh, incumbent Republicans or Republicans win in districts that Obama won. Uh, you know, Representative O'Brien down in uh, Kalamazoo County, you know, outperformed, uh, uh, you know, outperformed Governor Romney by over by about 7,000 votes, about nine points. So it does come down to individual candidates, and that's why I was laying out the case is talking about some of these individual candidates that we have coming in uh, this fall. We have a great diversity of individuals. Uh, somebody talking about a safer Republican seat such as Holland, I try to remind folks there's no such thing as a safe, uh, a safe seat because you need to work your district, be available, be accessible and accountable to your voters, but uh, Daniela Garcia with a great background in education and health care is going to be the uh, uh, first Hispanic female uh, Republican in, in, in our caucus joining uh, Representative Rendon from up north who is also an Hispanic uh, American. So we, we see some of that uh, diversity, but you also, uh, in terms of individuals out there working, I think we have a very aggressive uh, crew where they, they're actually out there listening. I mean, I look at my schedule over this last weekend, uh, you know, in terms of going to the Lawrence Oxrose Festival, the Bangor, uh, uh, per, you know, the Bangor Bridge Walk in the morning, a pancake breakfast, you know, working to make sure I'm available, accessible, and accountable to the constituents of my district. And that's why I continue to do doors around my district. You know, yesterday when I was out doing doors in Kalamazoo County, listening to stories on how we need to ensure that we need to put more money in, into the roads and how they feel that, you know, the housing prices are finally starting to go up. There's a little bit more of a sense of optimism. And so that's how we stay in touch with, with the constituents. And I, and I look at this fall is that as you see, you know, as I explained two years ago, you have a lot of individuals that, you know, that run their own races and people trust them in terms of making those decisions and being independent voices for Michigan. You've mentioned roads a couple of times, and it, it is an interesting question as an observer, because over in the House, you came up with a plan that would have produced perhaps a half billion dollars, depending on the numbers, but let's say for easy figuring, an additional half billion dollars on a recurring basis, in addition to the one-time money that you mentioned. It was not something that the Senate was able to deal with before they broke for the summertime. Is your life as the guy who's trying to elect Republicans in the House easier if the Senate uh, takes care of that before the election? I think providing a foundation for roads and transportation funding is, is, is critical, not just for any elections, but because it's good policy. And what the House Republicans did, we passed a plan that really used 90 percent of you know, existing revenue and prioritizing our budget. You know, as I explained three and a half years ago, we were able to cut waste and, and cut the budget to where we were able to get to a more sustainable way. And over the last several years, we've put nearly $900 million into roads and transportation. You're starting to see those projects, not just around Kent County here. If I look at my own district with M43 between Bangor and South Haven, I see the project in Madawan just getting started uh, this week, a project in Lawton getting started this week. So we're seeing some of those results of money that wouldn't have been there otherwise if we didn't have our budget balanced and weren't prioritizing. The plan we sent over the Senate, and I, I'm confident the Senate will, will act this fall, uh, will put a more solid foundation in terms of providing an extra half billion dollars a year into transportation funding. I know Representative Shirky, another leader in the caucus that's going over to the, uh, the Senate uh, next year, introduced a plan to get us to a billion dollars over the next five years of increased spending without a tax increase. And so I think looking at around the, the policy issues that, you know, I have the same challenges and the same worries and the same, uh, you know, that, that a lot of individuals do. I, I had to uh, fix, uh, you know, fix one of my tires, a you know, $200 new tire for my uh, car this spring because the roads are in bad condition, $120 alignment. And these are, you know, it's my case, and you can name dozens of other cases from constituents that I hear from. And so we're continuing, we put a down payment on roads and we're going to grow that. Representative Eric Nesbitt, it's interesting to get your take on this election cycle now some 60 plus days away or there about 60 days by the time this airs. Thank you for coming in. We'll talk about this perhaps between now and then and certainly after November. Thanks, Rick. And we're back with more To The Point in just a moment. So there are two very different takes on the upcoming state house elections. We'll continue to follow those and see exactly how they turn out. 
Coming up in the weeks ahead, we've already booked the candidates for governor, both Democratic and Republican, working on those same candidates for the United States Senate, as well as for Attorney General, Secretary of State, and much more. I hope you'll join us next and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock on Wood TV 8 for To The Point.